one of the most common questions for beginning astrophotographers is just how long should my individual subs be? There's no real guidance in the camera manual. While some acquisition software does provide some guidance, it basically depends on you knowing what it is that you need to fill in there. I know at least for me, that was a little complicated in the beginning. So what I want to do here is bring together some information from various places in the net and try to synthesize it into a simple, basic method for how to determine what your correct sub-exposure length should be. And so let's get into the details and hopefully this will make things clearer when we're done. The place where we're going to begin is the equation to determine what your optimal background signal level should be. This is based on the work of John Riesta in this Cloudy Nights post. It's a simple, straightforward formula, and it gives you kind of a range in which you can be. So we're going to look at this formula in a little bit of detail, explain where the parts come from. Here's John's equation. Dn is the target median background level that we want to get. We're going to be able to look at that in our acquisition program, whether it's Sequence Generator Pro or Nina. Uh, presumably other acquisition programs will show us this as well. SF, the swamp factor, is basically a multiplicative factor that we're going to use to determine how much more we need an exposure level to bury the read noise in our exposure. Don't get too hung up on that right now but we're going to come back to that in the next slide. Read noise is the read noise that's inherent in the sensor. If we take a zero length exposure, it should be made up primarily of read noise and offset. In this case, we need that read noise in electrons. Gain is the camera gain in electrons per ADU. The offset is the bias offset that we have in every exposure. In some cases, like if you're using the ZWO ASCOM driver, that offset is fixed at 50. But many drivers allow you to set that offset, and if you can set it, then you know what it is. If you can't set it, then we need to look it up somewhere. Bits is the analog to digital converter bit depth of the camera, and that's something that we need to look up. That part of the equation on the right, that 2 to the 16th divided by 2 to the bits, that is needed if your camera driver reports things in 16 bits, but your camera is not a 16-bit camera. That's the case for the ZWO ASCOM driver. Our camera for the ASI 1600 is 12 bits, but the driver reports things in 16 bits. Or if you have a camera like the ASI 294, that camera is a 14-bit camera, but again, it reports in 16 bits. And so what this does is scale from the native units to the 16-bit units. In the case of the ASI 1600, that's going to scale everything by a factor of 16. In the case of the ASI 294, that's going to scale by a factor of 8. If your camera is actually 16 bits, then this number is 1, and it's not going to do anything. So now that we have the equation and we have at least a rough idea of what those components mean, let's look at what the optimal exposure level is. In this case, the swamp factor becomes 10. John didn't just pull this number out of the air. This is statistically the best number for getting us a good sub-exposure link that will stack efficiently to bury the noise. Sometimes you can't get to a number that's 10 times that because you'd end up clipping too many stars. If that's the case, there's a minimum exposure level that John recommends, which is three times. And he doesn't recommend that you go below that because if you go below three times that, then the read noise becomes too much of a component of your sub-exposures and it's not going to stack well and you're still going to have a very noisy image at the end. So what we're aiming for is a, an exposure that's somewhere between three times and ten times. Now we know the equation, we know what the elements of the equation mean, but where do we get the values? If we use PixInsight, there's an easy way to do it. There's a script in PixInsight called Basic CCD Parameters, and using it we'll be able to learn the gain and the read noise for our camera. The way we get that is by using two flat frames, two bias frames, and two dark frames. These frames should all be taken at the same temperature and gain. In this case, the temperature is minus 15 degrees Celsius, and the gain is 15. The flats should be taken at the same exposure length. In this case, I think I have two of my blue flats. The dark frames should be taken with a difference of about 10 times in exposure length. So in my case, I'm using a 3-second dark and a 30-second dark. Let's plug those in 
here's our two flats. Here are our two bias. We'll plug in the shorter of the uh, dark frames here and the longer of the dark frames there. The shorter one is three, the longer one is 30. And we're using the ASI 1600, which is a 12-bit camera. The CFA checkbox stands for color filter array, and you would use that with color cameras. Let's see what it tells us. So for the readout noise in electrons, it says it's 3.2. And for the gain in electrons per ADU, it says it's 4.1. And that's all we need, except for the offset, which we, uh, in this case, used the ASI ASCOM driver, which defaults to an offset of 50. Here's an exposure level calculator that I put together based on that equation. It'll tell us what the minimum and optimal exposure levels are that we should aim for. In the example before, our read noise was 3.2 electrons. Our gain was 4.1 electrons per ADU. Our offset was 50, and our bit depth is 12. And that tells us that our optimal background level is 1,200 and that our minimum is 920. If we're between those numbers, we're in pretty good shape. If we're over 1200, that's okay. The only question is how much we're going to clip. We're gonna look at how you can determine if you're clipping too much. Ultimately, that's something of a subjective choice, but there are some ways that you can at least evaluate whether it's too much for the particular kind of image you're working on. If we're below 920, John's recommendation is that we don't go, you know, that we raise the exposure until we get to at least 920, regardless of the clipping that we're incurring, because below that, the read noise is going to be too high. Let's look at another example now, this time for the same camera, but it gained 76. The temperature is still minus 15 degrees. So I have the set of files that we need already loaded. There's the flats, the bias, the three second dark, the 30 second dark, 30, and we're still a 12-bit camera. And so now we can see that the gain has gone from 4 up to 2. Our readout noise has dropped from 3 down to 2.1. 2.1, 2, and you can see that our numbers for minimum and optimal drop by just a little bit. What should we do in a case where we don't have the flats, darks, and bias frames yet in order to determine what our optimal exposure level should be? In that case, we can go to the manufacturer's web page and get at least an approximation of what numbers should be. And those are probably good enough. Uh, we don't need to be exact here. This is to get in the right ballpark. And as you can see from the results that we've gotten, there's a fairly wide range between minimally acceptable and optimally good. So let's continue to look at the ASI 1600 here. If we scroll down, we can see it's a 12-bit camera. So that's one of the places where we can find that information or of course from the manual. Now this piece of information here, the read noise, that's the minimum read noise the camera can produce in this case. So that's not what we want because we know that read noise is going to vary with gain. So let's continue to scroll down and there's a bunch of useful graphs. We can see the second graph shows the gain in electrons per ADU versus the gain that we supply when we're using the ASCOM driver. And let's use gain 139. That's a common gain that many people use for narrowband imaging with this camera. It's unity gain on the camera so that it's one electron per ADU. So we can see that here in the graph. That's where the line intersects with one. If we come down to the read noise, we don't have something quite as, as convenient for us on the graph, but 139 is about there. Let's call it about midway between 1.5 and 2, so 1.75 electrons worth of read noise. Our read noise was 1.75. Our gain is 1. 
and we get our minimum and optimal exposure levels. And we did that without taking a single frame. So as long as you can get access to those numbers, then you can figure out what your at least ballpark figures are. And given that all of this is pretty much a statistical thing, then that ballpark is probably good enough. Now let's use some sample images to evaluate how that formula behaves in the real world. On the left here is a single red frame from the Cocoon Nebula. It was taken at gain 15 and 60 seconds. You can see there's really not much to see. Of course, the image is still linear and we haven't applied a screen stretch. There are a few bright stars. Right off the bat, that gives us a hint about what clipping is going on. If we can see these stars, they're either already clipped or the odds are pretty good that they're going to clip when they're stretched. And so we just have a scattering of them here. So that's that's probably good. We can get a more quantitative idea by using the statistics process. And what it shows us is, and make sure it's set to 16-bit here if you want to evaluate it in terms of what the camera's reporting in your acquisition software, that our median is 1056 which is between our minimum and upper bounds. It's a little on the low side, but I wanted to use the same exposure length for red, green, and blue. I knew red was going to be the weakest channel that way, but it made things simpler for me. At this point, things were complex enough that finding some ways to simplify things was good. It made it less likely for me to make a mistake. If we look at the blue frame, the mean is at 11.52, so a little bit higher, but still below our maximum, or our optimum, excuse me. And green is at 11.36. So all three of these are looking pretty decent in terms of, of getting a good sub-exposure. Now let's look at where things went wrong. This is a single subframe of N27. It does not have a screen stretch applied. And you can see the mean background level is 12,000, not 1,200, 12,528. The image is so exposed that you can actually see M27 there in the center of the frame. This was taken for one minute at gain 250 on the ASI 294, and I just screwed up. I'm not sure what I was thinking at the time, but look at all the stars you can see here. Every one of those stars is probably going to clip when we stretch if they're not already clipped. And in fact, there's the final M27 image, and there's the final Cocoon image, which was taken at gain 15. And you can see the star color is much better here. Now, to be fair, this was stretched with histogram stretch, and this was stretched with mask stretch, and mask stretch preserves color much better. And this is a year further down the road. I hope I'm a better image processor now than I was then. But even if I were to reprocess this image from scratch today, there wouldn't be much star color there. I really messed up when I set the exposure that high. There's another way that we can evaluate these things as well. And we can use a script. And this script is not part of PixInsight, but I'll provide the link for where you can find it in the show notes and it's called 2D Plot. And it's a great way to actually evaluate what your images are, are doing. Now, it, it shows things in the PixInsight 0 to 1 scale first, but you probably want to look at things in 16 bits so you can look at them in terms of the numbers you're used to seeing from your camera. What this does is it takes a single pixel slice through the image. In this case, it's doing a vertical slice. And we can see where it's going by clicking that. And then we can click anywhere we like. Let's look at this spot right here where we know there's a bright star and go back to the line graph. And we can see that bright star is up at near 10,000. It's still not clipped. I don't know whether it's going to clip when it gets stretched. Our next brightest star is down here at 2,000. And then this is where our background level and our DSO, if we actually have any DSO in that particular slice, is living. So that's a great way to actually kind of evaluate what's going on. Let's 
Let's go horizontal since we get more pixels that way and take another slice through here. You can see that star, bright star, is up a little bit higher. We've got a couple bright ones, but overall this looks pretty good. We're not really in danger of clipping much. Now let's look at this one. I think we're going to see a different story. And let's switch to 16-bit. Right away we can see our mean background level is quite a bit higher as we saw from statistics. We can also see we have many, many more stars above that background level. Let's go to horizontal and already we've got one clipped star. Let's take a slice right there. So we don't have any of M27 in this image or in this slice, I should say. And we have one clipped star. We have one star over 30,000, lots of stars in the 20,000s. You can see that when we go to stretch this, this is going to be a problem. Now, granted, we're not going to have to stretch it too hard because our main background level is already very high. It, it's definitely going to be a problem for us. Finally, let's talk about how you can do this evaluation while you're actually acquiring your images. Here we have Sequence Generator Pro loaded up with a single sub from the Cocoon. If we look over here on the right, and of course this may be in a different spot depending on how you have your screen laid out, we have the Image Statistics panel. And we can see our mean, median, excuse me, is 1056. And so that's a great simple way to evaluate. If you don't have the Image Statistics module up, you can come up here to view docking modules and image statistics and bring that in docking module up. So that's how you can evaluate things while you're actually out under the stars, or at least while your telescope is out under the stars, and determine what your optimal exposure should be. Now in terms of getting the actual exposure length, all you need to do is take a sample exposure, see if it falls in that range that you're looking for. If it's too low, increase. If it's too high, uh, decrease until you get to the right level. There are optimal exposure calculators, but if you're mixing gains in your projects, then they're not going to be too useful for you. And the reason for that, if we look at the Equipment Profile Manager here and here we look at my profile that I use when I use Sequence Generator Pro. There's some information on the camera and the readout noise there I have is 2.2 electrons. It's going to use that to calculate the optimal exposure for us. It We'll only get that right if that readout noise matches the gain we happen to be using. And if you're mixing gains in a project, it's going to be wrong for at least one of them. Using the exposure calculator may not be practical. That's why I like this method. It allows you to take a few frames, which don't need to be out under the stars, measure what your camera's performance actually is, and then determine what your exposure levels should be. And then typically in the course of two or three exposures, you can get that dialed in very quickly. I hope this was helpful. If there's anything that's unclear, please let me know, and I'll see if I can do uh, some clarification. It's always possible there are mistakes here. Like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm just trying to share what I know with others in the hopes that we can all learn from each other. So clear skies and good luck with your images.